Our final speaker is Joy Conley. She is Provost and Senior Vice President at the Graduate Center at uh, City University of New York. Before joining the Graduate Center in August 2016, uh, Joy was Dean of, for the Humanities and Professor of Classics at NYU. Earlier in her career, she taught at the University of Washington and at Stanford. Conley's research focuses on Roman ideas about aesthetics, communications, ethics, and political action, particularly as they relate to the 18th century and the contemporary world. Her first book, The State of Speech, examined the role of communication of Roman ideals of citizenship, the life of Roman republicanism, Princeton 2014, analyzed key themes in Roman thought, freedom, recognition, antagonism, self-knowledge, irony, and imagination. Conley is also the author of Going on the Market, a handbook available online that helps students navigate graduate school as well as the job application and postdoctoral fellowship processes. Along with scholarly articles and book chapters, she has written essays and reviews for the Times Literary Supplement, The Nation, and the New York Times Book Review. Joy? Can I close this or will the screen explode if I... Uh, you can close it. All right. Thank you. Thanks to everyone for coming. Thanks to my fellow panelists and to the program committee for setting this up. Did you say my title, Alan? I, I, I did not. I will then, okay. <laughs> my title is Against Purity, Classical Strategies for Collective Thought and Action Now. Classical scholarship emerged in the 12th and 13th centuries in response to an urgent necessity, the need for a secular discourse of collective politics, a discourse that would offer alternatives to the rule of king or church. I want classics to reclaim its historical role in giving people language with which we can articulate our roles in collective life, which means diving deep into the tempests of public discourse, either in the classroom or in our research, or maybe both. My contribution today, or so I hope, is to claim that Ciceronian rhetoric can do now what it did in the early modern period and again in the 18th century, as we heard earlier in the panel. It can help us think a new style of political thought and action. The most pressing problem we face today as citizens is an intensified condition of economic instability I'll call precarity. While precarity, or precariousness, but precarity is simpler, precarity has always been with us, but it's a condition, a, a condition affecting more and more people in the industrial world now, and thanks to social media and other factors, the damage it's doing is more visible now than in recent history. Precarity has a racial and a gendered dimension. Whites and men are still more likely to be haves, and women and people of color are more likely to be have-nots. Economic precarity is linked to political precarity. Those living in a precarious state are not just living outside of politics. They are living out a particular form of political destitution, as Judith Butler puts it, a form whose outlines reveal how the well-off and the privileged police the boundaries of conventional politics. Elites are policing those boundaries right now with various calls, direct or indirect, for purity. Some of this is the old right-wing friend-enemy strategy, you're either with us or against us, that we saw in the Bush administration and that we hear every day in Trump's yelps of misogyny and racism. The left has been cultivating its own calls for purity, deeply problematic in my view, especially on American college campuses. But rather than get caught up in what's now a pretty familiar debate about how pure our language should be over safe spaces, over comfort zones, trigger warnings, and special snowflakes, I want to come at this another way. Our problem, I've said, is precarity. The necessary and correct response, in my view, is to craft a new politics of cohabitation with people experiencing conditions of precarity. Now, when it comes to political action, someone like Cicero, doesn't care about precarity or politics of cohabitation. Cicero's own practical aim as a politician was to strengthen senatorial power and his own influence. But his rhetorical theory, nonetheless, points a way forward. 
The Occupy movement, Black Lives Matter, and other political movements today rightly insist that we must invent a politics that gives a part to have no part, as Ranciere memorably put it. To do this, we need to begin from the voices, views, and beliefs of those living in precarity, not to inject them into politics as we know it now, but to start a politics afresh. And the challenge then is how to create a dialogic style of talk and action that allows for the politically destitute to enter the space of politics in conditions of non-domination, that is, without being dominated by those who are at home in politics as we now know it, and I'm including us in that group, those who know. To Cicero, speech is the civic glue of the republic. The republic is literally, as I called my first book, a state of speech. So Cicero's descriptions of the good orator and his arts should be understood as constituting a kind of citizen's handbook. His ideal orator, which is to say the ideal Republican citizen, is a man who cultivates a heterogeneous style of speech and manner that reflects the variety of his experiences in real life and in his imagination, a term I'll come back to again. It's necessary for the orator to have seen and heard many things and to have gone over many subjects in reflection and reading, he says in De Oratora. He must not take possession of these things as his own property, but rather take sips of them as things belonging to others. He must explore the very veins of every type, age, and class. He must taste of the minds and senses of those before whom he speaks. This is De Oratora 1, 218 and 223, for those of you who want to look it up. One truth Cicero recognizes in his rhetorical work that I want to, and that underlies that passage that I want to recuperate here is that the Republic is an unchosen assembly. That is, we don't select our fellow citizens. And a Republic is not a kin group, so we don't resemble one another. We come in all shapes and sizes. In our plurality of perspectives, goals, hopes, and dreams, we might not like each other very much. And this is why I've always been suspicious of Aristotelian accounts of citizenship that model themselves on friendship. Cicero sees clearly what Hannah Arendt also saw, that the human condition is this, is plurality. Plurality means that we can't reliably know what each of us believes and wh or why or what we'll think or do next. Plural political thought and action requires exposing ourselves to people and views that we don't have a say over, even if and as we seek to influence other people. Judith Butler notes that we have not fully brokered these conditions, and indeed, we must not. A genuinely plural politics cannot emerge from agreements with pre-selected partners who already know how to play the game, and we must learn to speak accordingly. I think living in universities makes it very easy to forget this. Most of us here come from very highly selective environments indeed. And despite the claims of many schools to hire faculty or recruit students who, quote, reflect the diversity of the United States, they are really quite pure environments. The ongoing complaints of students of color and poor students that they feel deeply unwelcome in many selective institutions are evidence of this purity. Now I say this not to scold us, but to emphasize honestly the considerable challenge that faces most of us academics who th seek to think seriously and self-critically about politics and about writing and teaching about politics. So I return to Cicero because I think anyone who wants to chart a mutually justifiable course for our unavoidably common life must take part in the quest for reasonable terms of social cooperation, setting the highest premium on effective communication and mutual understanding. Cicero's good orator, his good citizen that is, is capable of grasping and articulating the plural perspectives that make responsible and effective politics possible. To do this, Cicero argues that the orator must first be in control of himself. He must cultivate propriety, or decorum, the rhetorical virtue Cicero sees as the most important of all. Cicero's proper man governs himself under the watchful gaze of the community, whose approval he needs to work his persuasive powers and, yes, to exert his fullest authority. To speak persuasively is to forcefully articulate one's views and try to impose them on others. but. It is also to own a self-critical sensibility, a flexible command of vocabulary and cultural values, a capacity to conform with social rules and moral norms, and to risk vulnerability in the face of uncertainty. 
After all, we never know exactly what someone will say in reply to what we say. And Cicero goes on at some length about the stage fright that rightly afflicts good orators who are keenly attuned to the audience's unpredictability. So think about that the next time you're nervous before giving a talk or teaching a class. Contemporary conservatives like to complain that liberals have tried to make the very concept of self-government illegitimate. But Cicero treats self-government in terms very congenial, I think, to liberals and progressives. What he seeks, ultimately, is the eradication of fear. As he knows from years of civil strife, fear kills freedom. Propriety means restraining the violent, overreaching behaviors, uh, especially, he thinks, uh, uh, senatorial people are, are, uh, tend to commit these, uh, these uh, or fall into these kinds of behaviors that increased public mistrust and fear. Having learned to moderate those activities that arouse fear among his fellow citizens, and having explored, as I quoted before, the very veins of every type, age, and class, Cicero's orator is in a position to assume multiple perspective, perspectives, multiple values, and points of view. In its theory and in its schoolroom exercises, the Roman rhetorical tradition asks students to try to think in the position of others. Now, as Danell pointed out from his, with his uh, analysis of the Seneca controversia, does the evidence show that they did so according to our values? Did they apply the same test? No, of course they didn't. But Cicero's presentation of the good citizen as necessarily and constantly alive to the views and fears of others, with the proven capacity to imagine and identify with the experience of others, gives us a gauge for ourselves in our practice and for those we consider electing to office. And it provides a pro very provocative frame, I think, for our classrooms, as Curtis pointed out in his talk. Like Hannah Arendt, Cicero sees imagination as the key tactic in the orator's response to the human condition of plurality. Arendt noted that thinking politically involves, and I quote, always and primarily, even if I am quite alone, uh, an anticipated communication with others with whom I know I must finally come to some agreement. And she described, and I quote again, an enlarged way of thinking that needs the presence of others in, whom, in whose place it must think, whose perspective it must take into consideration, and without whom it never has the opportunity to operate at all. So here are calls for purity that I am against. The claim that language and experience and imagination should be hived off according to contemporary identi identity politics categories, according to gender, race, class, sexuality, or religious group. The effort to restrain attempts to imagine the experience of others through art, literature, and political speech, like the protests against the white painter Dana Schutz's painting of Emmett Till in the last Whitney Biennial. And the refusal to invite into dialogue those who hold different views from those predominant in the academy. I'm really thinking of something as banal as lecture series that we all go to or not, uh, depending on our time. If, we're, if we are to acknowledge our human interdependence and to make it real in our politics, we need Im the imagination of others to express itself in our speech, our novels, movies, plays, paintings, and lectures. We need to listen to those in precarity advising us on how our efforts to imagine can cause fear and pain, because sometimes they will, but we can't stifle our efforts to imagine. Following Cicero's injunction that the good citizen orator gain a deep understanding of the experience of others, we must make it a priority to dismantle the walls separating the university from those who live in conditions of precarity. Learning how to talk with those who have no part, who don't know the lessons, uh, who don't know the, the rules of the game, will create messiness, unpredictability, probably at the start, more antagonism. But our task as academics, and this is really my main Ciceronian point, is not to reinforce group identities of various separate but equal sorts, but to learn how to craft an inclusive we the people. Historically, the arts of rhetoric have helped enable a lot of rich men order the, order, order the world to their profit and pleasure. Now, Cicero is no exception, but he knew very well that plurality is against purity, and rhetoric is justly an impure art. I've tried here to reclaim some of its most useful impurities. Of course, we need to acknowledge, and I hope I have, that rhetoric is a dis discourse of domination, but we need to study its rich explorations of political psychology, embodied communication, performed ethics and community formation, and turn it to our own plural purposes. Thank you. <laughs>